It's rare that a direction on a compass can carry such loaded connotations, and yet, in discussing the history of Europe, East is a complicated word. In the past few centuries, Eastern Europe earned an unfair reputation for backwardsness, poverty, and unsophistication, for reasons we will see. It's also rare for the simple act of reading history to cause me physical and psychological pain. And yet, Poland! for reasons we will see. Our notions of Polish hardship tend to focus on the 1900s, what with the Soviets and the Nazis out and about, but Poland's status as the volleyball of Europe actually goes back quite a ways. Yet despite the best attempts of half a dozen different empires, Poland would not die, and that is worth investigating. So, to see how Poland's story unfolds and find out what Lithuania has to do with it, let's do some history. Being well outside of the Roman and Holy Roman empires, we don't get much on Poland until the medieval period. When Duke Mieszko I converted to Catholicism in 966 and began expanding his duchy out across the northern European plain, reaching up to the Baltic Sea and down to the Carpathian Mountains. His son Boleslav I negotiated with Holy Roman Emperor Otto III to grant Poland an independent church governance, adding three new bishoprics to their original one and a shiny archbishopric in their capital of Gniezno. To celebrate, Boleslav promoted himself to king, but made the classic goof of splitting his kingdom between his sons. The hope was to keep government local and responsive, but the result was several functional independent minor dukedoms who occasionally threw hands at each other. His grandson brought the kingdom back together, but then it got divided again in 1138, and it stayed that way for two centuries. A consequence of this was a move away from a single rigid hierarchy to a more dynamic society of tenant farmers, merchants, and nobles spread out across market towns, church lands, and noble estates. Meanwhile, the crown's relative weakness was an opening for the church to educate, govern, and shape Polish culture. It's at this surprisingly early stage that an idea approximating nationalism appears as the church at the time was the only major body that transcended local politics, and some clergy vocally advocated for a reunified state under the Polish crown. Hang on to the theme of indivisibility, it comes up later. Another big change came in the form of people, as Germans from the HRE and persecuted Jews came to settle in Poland. In 1264, Bolesław granted Jews personal freedoms and legal protections, which was a major rarity elsewhere in Christendom. And this welcome got a whole lot warmer during the reign of Kazimierz III, who extended Jewish freedoms to the entire kingdom in 13 and encouraged more Jews to come to Poland. Kazimierz also gets points for codifying laws, issuing a new standard currency, founding the first Polish university, unifying the political machinery of the kingdom, that's a big one, and recouping some of the land lost a century earlier to the Teutonic Knights in the north and the Mongols in the east. The man was busy, and late medieval Poland didn't slow down. After Kazimierz, the crown passed through his sister to her husband Ludwig of Hungary. That wasn't the best match, as he confiscated some Polish territory for Hungary and bribed the nobles with special privileges to let him do what he wanted. But after him, his daughter Jadwiga became queen of Poland, and she married Grand Duke Jogaiwa of Lithuania, which bound the Kingdom of Poland to the Duchy of Lithuania in a personal union. Lithuania was very large, but also very pagan, so as part of the marriage deal, Yogaiwa and his state converted to Christianity. Despite one of history's largest overnight conversions, the two states remained very different, and the Teutonic Knights along the coast saw Lithuania as barbarous pagans, so they tried to invade, but lost at the Battle of Grunwald in 1410. In the century after the Union, late medieval Poland saw its first local assemblies of nobles, and in the 1490s, the Szlachta, as they're known in Polish, formed a statewide parliament called the Sejm. By the 1500s, Renaissance arts and ideas made their way north, and when paired with good administration, some nice reforms, and hefty resource exports to Western Europe, Poland was living it up in a golden age. You know Copernicus with the heliocentrism? Yeah, Poland. Now, the personal union between Poland and Lithuania was a familiar political arrangement. Europe made these things all the time, but it was rare they lasted two whole centuries. In that span, Lithuania began to resemble Poland in a few key ways, but it was still its own country and opposed to a simple incorporation. So, after some political wrangling, the Union of Lublin in 1569, nice, established a bifederal state with a jointly elected king slash grand duke and a bicameral parliament of the noble Sejm and a senate. It. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, as it was to be known, had independent local laws, treasuries, and armies for each state. And if this all sounds kind of insane, that's because it is, which is the best part. At a time when the rest of Europe was big on centralized government and royal absolutism, the Commonwealth was a federal monarchy which was elected by a parliament of nobles who themselves accounted for 10% of the population. That's nearly how many people could vote in democratic Athens. To make this outlier even more extreme, the 
Commonwealth in the 1600s was one of the largest and most populous countries in Europe, with 11 million people spread out over 400,000 square miles. That included Poles, Lithuanians, Germans, Belarusians, and Ukrainians, Jews, and Tatars. And between Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, three quarters of the world's Jews, and even some Muslims, it was astoundingly diverse, in part because it stood at the crossroads of several different cultures. But this regional centrality would become dangerous in the next two centuries, as basically every empire in a 500-mile radius was keen to grow larger at Poland's expense. Various threats came and went, but sometimes two would rear up at once, such as the latter 1650s when Sweden and Russia both invaded Lithuania in what's known as the Deluge. Cities were ransacked and plundered, and the whole Commonwealth briefly shrank to very small. The Commonwealth survived, but between war and ensuing plague, it was gravely wounded, a quarter of the population dead, vulnerable to outside threats, and falling into a governing crisis. See, the Republic had become a tragic victim of its own lofty ideology. Wanting to avoid even the slightest whiff of absolutism, the same had a liberum veto which allowed any member of the Schlachta to stop debate. In the best of times, this gave contrarians an instant handbrake on the entire legislative process, but it was also laughably easy for foreign powers to abuse. A single bribe could throw a critical reform right out the window. So by the 1700s, the same regularly failed to make any decisions. This was good news for the empires that encircled Poland, as Russia, Prussia, and Austria all stood to gain from Poland's newfound weakness and wanted to make it their puppet state. In 1764, Russia installed Stanislav II as king, and four years later, a confederation of nobles at Bar threw a rebellion against Russian influence and interference. So, Russia invaded, and then Prussia and Austria just kind of also invaded while Poland was distracted. By 1772, a third of the Commonwealth was partitioned between the three empires. From here, King Stanislav was stuck between doing nothing and letting things things get worse, or going rogue and actually trying to fix Poland's problems, which would provoke the empires and make things get worse. To his credit, he went for it, calling a four-year Great Same in 1788 to write out a new constitution for the state. And a really good one, too. They even dropped the Liberum Veto. But of course, this was way out of line, so Russia and Prussia, and then later Austria, invaded with the explicit goal of wiping Poland off the map. By 1795, the three empires had partitioned the entire Commonwealth, and Poland-Lithuania was fully gone. Poof. So, what does one do when an ancestral homeland gets sliced up like a birthday cake? That's a good question! <laughs> Well, as the 1800s show, you write poetry, paint, and throw a lot of revolts. Poland was right along many Europeans in channeling Romantic Era ideals into a struggle for nationhood, but Poland's situation was a little unique, as they had a nation, and in the cultural sense they still did, but they didn't have a state. In an interesting return to the 1200s, ideology focused on the church as a cultural anchor point for Polishness, and this meant that Poland as a concept narrowed significantly, away from the multi-ethnic and multi faith society of the Commonwealth and towards what we'd call ethno-nationalism. Yikes. <laughs> Really running with that Catholicism angle, Polish thinkers conceived of their country as the Christ of nations, which died in the partition as a martyr for other nations and would one day re-emerge. I mean, in hindsight, not strictly wrong. Polish life under partition differed between the three empires. After some short-lived Napoleonic shenanigans, the Congress Kingdom of Poland existed as a vassal state under the supervision and direct governance of the Russian Empire. Later in the century, it was stripped of what autonomy it had and got fully absorbed into Russia. The situation the situation was a little better in Austria, as the Polish-majority province of Galicia was quite poor but decently autonomous, and Galicia became a center of Polish consciousness as the century progressed. By contrast, Prussia, later Germany, had no taste whatsoever for Polish culture, and pushed for Germanization across the whole empire, but onto Poland especially. Germany's slice of Poland gained from the Industrial Revolution, but it was a pretty patchy process overall. And across the board, post hoc justifications for partition relied on harsh stereotypes that have endured to this day. No, 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 guys, you don't understand. It's not that we're greedy, it's that they're bad and don't deserve to exist. <laughs> Colonization attitudes in my Europe? It's more likely than you think. Despite several attempts at uprising made over the century, none succeeded, and over three million Poles emigrated for the United States. It seemed as though the only hope for a revived Poland was the complete collapse of the great European empires. But, as it happened, 
That would not take long. And as we step into the First World War, I've got to work very hard to not fall into the infinite web of tangents and books worth of footnotes for 1900s history. So, World War I in the East was not a game of trench warfare, but armies constantly on the move causing widespread destruction. The collapse of all three partitioning empires and sympathy among the Allied powers cleared the room for a new Polish state to rise out of the war, but there was constant friction with the other new post-war states, such as Lithuania. Meanwhile, Germany and Soviet Russia hated all of this, so Poland's task of reunifying and running their state also faced external pressure of German posturing and full-on Soviet invasion. In September of 1939, the Nazis invaded Poland and the Soviet Union followed two weeks later, partitioning Poland just like the olden days. Russians persecuted class and political enemies, Germans persecuted race enemies. And so the Holocaust happened. Death camps like Auschwitz contributed to the systematic death of five million Poles, three million of whom were Jewish. They also killed Polish politicians, priests, and thinkers in a bid to exterminate Polish culture. In the face of this utter barbarity, the Polish resistance was among the strongest in Europe, staging two mass uprisings and organizing military operations across the continent. Poles played a key role in cracking the Enigma mechanism and were vital pilots in the Battle of Britain. This got marginally better but infinitely more uncomfortable when Russia joined the Allies and after the war the Soviets turned Poland into a communist satellite state. Once again, Poland was materially and demographically devastated by the conflict and the heavy-handed policies of Stalin weren't the most helpful in the rebuilding process. Over the decades, various reforms were made and undone, and then made again, and so on, and once again, the church acted as a vehicle for Polish unity, this time in opposition to communism. The election of Cardinal Wojtyla of Krakow as Pope John Paul II was an indescribably huge deal for Poland. After the trade union Solidarity started in 1980 and gained a huge following among Polish workers, support from America and the Vatican helped it become the main political opposition against the communist government. And the church facilitated the negotiations to allow Solidarity to participate in the elections of 1989, which broke the communist monopoly on power. Poland's pathway out of communism in the 90s and beyond brought another series of struggles, but it's largely a space they've been before. And that's one of the most confounding aspects of Polish history. There are so many plot lines that seem to echo across time, and there's also so much that couldn't have happened anywhere else. Who could wind up with a government system as absolutely bonkers as the Commonwealth? It's amazing! Polish history can read like a tragedy, because often it is, but the Polish people have more than demonstrated that's no reason for fatalism. Thank you so much for watching. I'd like to apologize for the quality of my Polish pronunciation because while I often like to try, it is rare that I succeed. And, of course, I'd like to thank our community on Patreon for supporting the work that we do. Some of their names can be seen scrolling along right here. And I will see you all in the next video.